Hello everyone, my name is Desiree and I'm a librarian at the Bullet Public Library and I have six new books for you this month. The first one is called 100 Monsters in My School. Um, this is it's written by Bonnie Bader and illustrated by Brian Hendricks. So this is a fun book about the 100th day of school. A lot of classrooms do something special for the 100th day. Um, the main character, Jane Brain, she goes to a school that's a little bit different than yours probably. It's called Frank and Stein Elementary, which sounds like yeah, Frankenstein. So she goes to school with monsters. So she has vampires and werewolves and ghosts all part of her classroom. Um, her teacher, Miss Vampira, asks everyone to bring a hundred things to celebrate uh, this, the hundredth day of school. Uh, and Jean doesn't know what to bring. So she watches her friends bring in bangs and bats and all kinds of things. So you'll have to read it if you want to find out what Jane does that saves the day in the end. Our second book is called uh, The Monster in the Mattress, and this is a bilingual book. Um, and unlike a lot of bilingual books where you'll have like a line of text in English and then a line of text in another language like Spanish, um, this book is in two parts. So if you want to read it in English, you start here, read this way. If you want to read it in Spanish, you flip it over and read this way. So this book has six mysteries in it, uh, including what did Anita's brother do to her hamster, Pinky? Why is there a witch flashing on Sylvia's wall? Where is the missing kitten? And what invisible creature is bouncing on Rudy's bed? So I'm going to read you a little part of one of the mysteries. And this is called Abuela's Mystery Footprints in the Flower. Abuela cleared the counter and set out all the things she would need to make the cake for Abuelo's birthday tomorrow. There were milk, eggs and butter still cold from the refrigerator. There was vanilla for flavor and a small red and white can of baking powder. But the most important ingredient was the white silky flour she used for baking special treats. She popped open the silver flour tin. Just as she was about to reach in with her measuring cup, she saw them again. Right in the middle of the smooth white powder were two beds. Antonio, come here, quick, she called. What's wrong, answered Abuelo as he hurried into the kitchen. They're back. Here, come and look for yourself, said Abuela. Abuela looked over Abuela's shoulder. You're right. Looks like someone's been walking in your flower again and left their footprints behind, he chuckled. Abuela didn't laugh. She just shook her head. I don't understand it. No one else uses the flower but me, and I make sure the flower is all smooth and even when I put it away. Abuela lifted up the can and looked underneath to see if there were any bumps in the bottom that might explain the mysterious dents but the bottom of the can was perfectly straight. It doesn't make sense, Abuela continued. Most of the time the flower is completely smooth on top, and other times it has these strange little dents. Maybe it has something to do with the weather, if it's too hot or too cold or too wet or on certain days, Abuela suggested. I don't think so, said Abuela. The lid on the can is too tight. No air gets in at all. Then it's a mystery to me, said Abuela with a shrug as he left the room. Abuela put her fingers in each of the dents and pushed down hard to see if there was anything stuck underneath. But all she felt was the cool, soft flower. She pulled out two ghost white fingers and decided that Abuela was right. The footprints in the flower would have to stay a mystery because she had a cake to bake. So if you want to find out who or what is leaving footprints in the flower, you need to check out this book. Our third book is also a mystery. This is one of the Cam Jansen series. It's number 22, The First Day of School Mystery. Uh, if you haven't read any of the Cam Jansen series yet, uh, Cam is actually a nickname. The character's name is Jennifer, but she loves cameras and she has a really good memory. And so whenever she sees something that she wants to remember, she says click and takes a picture of it with her brain so she can remember it. She does this so much that her friends and her family start calling her camera or Cam for short. So our story starts on the bus on the first day of school for fifth, of fifth grade uh, with Cam and her friend Eric. There's a huge traffic jam and the bus school bus can't get through. So the gym teacher, Mr. Day, has all the kids get off the bus and he walks into school and they go right past the accident. So let's read a little bit about this. Um, the children walked past people stuck in their cars. Some were resting or reading. Others were taking, talking on small phones. Some people smiled and waved to the children. Look, Eric whispered, police cars. Maybe there was an accident. Cam and Eric kept, kept walking. Then they saw a large tree. When they walked past the tree, they saw the front end of a small green car. It had crashed into the tree. 
I hope no one was hurt, Eric said. Quiet in the back, Mr. Denny shouted. Cam and Eric walked quietly. Then, when they were close to the car, Cam whispered, Stop! Mr. Day and the other children kept walking. Cam waited until the others were a bit ahead. Then she whispered, The car doesn't look so bad, and there's no ambulance, so maybe no one was hurt. Police officers were standing by their cars, talking. Cam looked at the green car. She blinked her eyes and said, Click! Cam and Eric got close to the car and looked in. There are papers in the front seat, a white one and a pink one, Cam told Eric. There's a pair of sneakers on the floor and a tennis racket in the back. Cam blinked her eyes again and said, click. Get away from here, a tall uh, police officer told Cam and Eric. Let's go, Mr. Day called to them. Cam and Eric ran to the line. They quietly followed Mr. Day and the other children into the school. They opened room 118 uh, and met their new teacher, Miss Benson. They talked to the teacher for a little bit. Miss Benson walked through the room. She looked at the children's work and smiled. Then the door opened. Two police officers walked in. One was very tall, and one was not so tall and had a short beard. I remember the tall policeman, Cam whispered to Eric. He told us to get away from the car. Miss Benson hurried to the front of the room. I'm Officer Oppen, said the not so tall officer. He showed her a piece of paper and said, is this your car's license plate number? Miss Benson nodded. Did you drive your car to school to this morning? Yes, Miss Benson said. You left the scene of an accident, the tall officer told her. No, I didn't, Miss Benson said quickly. There must be some mistake. Please, the officers with the short beard said, you have to come with us. Miss Benson turned to the class. Sit quietly, she said. Then she left the room with the tall officer on one side and the short one on the other. So did Miss Benson actually have an accident? Or is she telling the truth and the officers have the wrong person? You will have to read it to find out. This is our nonfiction book. It's called Great Idea, and it's all about inventions and, um, and ideas. So the cool thing about this book is that it's written in a lot of different ways. It's not like a chapter book where there's a lot of paragraphs and you're just going to read top to bottom. Um, it opens with, here's a quote from Thomas Edison, to invent, you need a good imagination and a pile of junk. Then uh, here's a section um, about some different things, some different inventions. You can read them in any order you want. There is poems like this. This one's called Stairs. Here's to the man who invented stairs and taught our feet to soar. He was the first who ever burst into a second floor. The world would be downstairs today had he not found the key. So let his name go down to fame, whatever it may be. Um, there's a comic about uh, a guy and a robot. Um, there's some cool facts about different foods and how they were invented. And there's even... There's a little play about two kid, three kids um, experimenting with a time machine. So you can see it's laid out where each character is a different color. So you could read this yourself, or you could grab a couple of friends and read it like a play. So this is a fun book for anybody, really, who's interested in inventions or ideas or just random facts about lots of different things. All right. This is our fifth book. Um, it's a chapter book. It's called Save Me a Seat. Um, and it's written by Sarah Weeks and Gita Vardarajar. It covers one week in the life of two different students um, in the fifth grade, Joe and Ravi. The book is told in two voices, which means it alternates. The first chapter is Ravi talking, and the second chapter is Joe talking, uh, and back and forth. So it starts on the first day of school, and both of these boys are nervous about going to school. Uh, Ravi has just moved to America with his family from India, and even though English is his first language, he has an accent that makes it uh, difficult for some of his classmates to understand him and nobody pronounces his name correctly. Uh, and Joe is fairly quiet, and both of his two friends moved away over the summer. Um, so the boys do not start out as friends, but they soon develop a common enemy, uh, the class bully, Dylan Sumrey. So we're going to start the chapter. And one of the fun things about this book is it's divided into five sections, and each is a day, and it's labeled with what they eat in the cafeteria that day for lunch, because the cafeteria plays a pretty, pretty big role in the story. All right, so this is Joe talking. Please don't call on me, please don't call on me, please don't call on me, I think. But I can feel Mrs. Beam's head turning in my way. I groan. I have a feeling I know where this is heading. I sure hope Miss Frost remembered to tell Mrs. Beam about my APD. Nobody knew anything was wrong with me until I started school. 
The first week of kindergarten, I spent most of my time hiding in the coat closet with my hands over my ears. My teacher, Miss Kane, thought I was homesick, but that wasn't it at all. I didn't want to go home, I just couldn't handle the noise. It turns out I have something called auditory processing disorder, and it means I have trouble listening. I'm not deaf, I can hear just fine. In fact, in a way, the problem is that my hearing is too good, which is why I go to Miss Frost. She gives me exercises to help my ears and my brain agree about what to listen to and what to tune out. She also has M&Ms in the house, peanut ones, and she lets me eat as many as I want. Miss Frost understands what's going on, but pretty much nobody else does. They don't understand how hard it is for me to follow directions when the electric pencil sharpener is going, or the door keeps slamming, or I wor I'm worrying about whether someone is about to sneak up behind me and do something mean. They also don't understand how much I hate to be put on the spot, like when a teacher calls on me. As Mrs. Bean turns my way, I slide down in my seat. Even if she knows about my APD, it doesn't mean I'm safe. Sometimes teachers think they're doing you a favor by treating you like you're no different from anyone else. The thing is, I am different. I slide down even farther in my seat, as low as I can go without falling out. All I care about is not getting called on. It's not that I can't do math. I'm actually pretty good at it. But standing up in front of the class makes me nervous. And when I get nervous, I forget what I'm doing and I make mistakes. Turns out today is my lucky day, though, because the new kid shoots his hand straight up in the air like an arrow. He's wearing another white shirt, buttoned all the way up. Even the sleeves have been ironed flat. They're stiff, and they stick out funny like little wings. His desk is covered with a bunch of junk, including some shiny new mechanical pencils, which Dylan keeps eyeballing with a klepto gleam. Mrs. Bean looks right at me. At least I think she's looking at me. But then she calls on the new kid instead. Whew, that was close. And now this is Ravi talking. Ravi, says Mrs. Bean, would you like to come up to the board? This is it, the moment I've been waiting for. Yes, ma'am, uh, Mrs. Bean, I say quickly, correcting myself. In my hurry to get up, my knee bangs against my desk and all my school supplies fall to the floor. I don't want to miss this chance to show off my math skills, so I quickly bend down to pick up my things. My glasses start to slip down my nose, but before I can push them up, ah, something hard hits my forehead. It's Joe Sylvester's hand. Why has he done this? Bumps me with his rock-hard head. Can't he see I'm trying to collect my stuff? I rub my forehead as he rubs his. His giant foot is stepping on my name card. Big foot, I mutter under my breath. Dylan hears me and laughs. That's rich, he says. Big foot just sits there like a lump, but Dylan gets right down on the floor beside me and helps pick up the rest of my things. I thank him for his help, then take a deep breath and straighten my back. I am not going to allow anything to spoil this moment. This is my time to shine. I march up to the front of the class, take the blue marker from Mrs. Bean's hand, and face the whiteboard. I look at the first problem, 23 times 13. I close my eyes and the answer, answer comes to me in a flash, 299. But I'm not gonna blurt it out and take a bow. I'm going to show Mrs. Bean something she has never seen before. What you are about to witness is pure magic, a secret handed down from ancient times, I say with confidence. There's complete silence in the classroom. I think Mrs. Bean's jaw has just dropped. Take your time, I warn myself. I write the two numbers, one below the other, in blue marker. Then, with a red marker, I draw an arrow connecting the last digits of both numbers. Three times three is nine, I say aloud, writing nine in the one's place with the blue marker. Then I pick up the green marker and write two arrows like a cross. Two times three, plus three times uh, one is nine. I use blue again to write nine in the tens place. I look at the class. No one is moving. My plan is working perfectly. I draw an orange arrow connecting the tens digits with the num both of the numbers, and then pick up the blue marker again to write two in the hundreds place. The answer is 299, I proclaim, underlining the answer three times in purple, then replacing the cap on the marker with a satisfying click. Everyone is staring shell-shocked at the board amazed by what I've just done. Dylan Samreen grin grins at me. I think he's impressed. If this performance has not impressed Mrs. Beam as well, nothing will. Ravi, she says slowly, looking at all the arrows on the board, your answer is correct and your method is very uh, colorful, but, but, what can she mean but? But we do things differently here, she goes on, giving me that pity look again. Next time, we don't need to see the arrows, just the numbers will do. The purple marker slips from my hand, falling to the floor. First, my manners are too Indian for her, and now my math? What will the next humiliation be, I wonder, as I walk back to my desk?
So this is a really good book, whether you've ever felt out of place or whether you know people who felt out of place. Uh, plus, you're going to want to check back to see how Ravi and Joe deal with um, the class bully. It's a really good story. Our last book is uh, one of my favorites, Ramona Quimby, age eight. Uh, Ramona is in the third grade, and she lives with her parents, her older sister, Jesus, and a grumpy cat named Picky Picky. One of the things I love about Ramona is that even though it's written by an adult, uh, she remembers what it's like to be a kid. And um, Ramona deals with a lot of things that most of us do, like when adults just don't understand you and you have trouble explaining to them what's going on because you really don't understand what's going on either. Um, and Ramona has a lot of explaining to do because she, no matter how hard she tries, she's always getting herself into crazy situations, um, like this one. So this chapter is called The Hard-Boiled Egg Fad. So a fad, as I'm sure you guys know, is when something's popular for a little while. So at Ramona's school, bringing a hard-boiled egg for lunch is the fad this week. All right. When lunchtime came, Ramona collected her lunchbox and went off to the cafeteria, where after waiting in line for her milk, she sat at a table with Sarah, Janet, Marsha, and the other third grade girls. She opened her lunchbox, and there, tucked in a paper napkin, snug between her sandwich and an orange, was her hard-boiled egg, smooth and perfect, the right size to fit her hand. Because Ramona wanted to save the best for last, she ate the center out of her sandwich, tuna fish, and poked a hole in her orange so she could suck out the juice. Third graders did not peel their oranges. At last, it was time for the egg. There were a number of ways of cracking eggs. The most popular and the real reason for bringing an egg to school was knocking the egg against one's head. There were two ways of doing so, by a lot of timid little raps or by one big whack. Sarah was a rapper. Ramona, like Yardin, was a whacker. She took a firm hold on her egg, waited until everyone at her table was watching her, and whack! She found herself with a handful of crumbled shell and something cool and slimy running down her face. Everyone at Ramona's table gasped. Ramona needed a minute to realize what had happened. Her egg was raw. Her mother had not boiled her egg at all. She tried to brush the yellow yolk and slithery white out of her hair and away from her face, but she only su succeeded in making her hands eggy. So if you want to find out what happens to Ramona and her egg and all the other pickles she gets into in third grade, I would highly recommend you read uh, this book, Ramona Quimby, Age 8. So thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy this month's books as much as I did.